Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. I'm Gavin Shaw. Today, I'll be joined by Jake Rosen of Cerebro Sports, one of the best draft writers out there to cover a whole lot. His thoughts on the Knicks' young core, the case for trading up for Jaden Ivey, the case against taking Shaden Sharp, even if he falls. And finally, one prospect that Jake loves for the New York Knicks at pick 11. All that and more right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, and we want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day. Uh, we are now available on all platforms, and that includes on YouTube, where you can see my smiling face, and you can also see the smiling face of Jake Rosen of Cerebro Sports. We are about to get into it on all the top prospects real quick. I am Gavin Shaw, a play-by-play broadcaster uh, covering the lacrosse state championships this weekend, probably while you're watching this episode. So if you want to check that out, you can tune in on the NFHS network, but I assume you're a little bit more interested in Jake. So let's get into it with him right now on Locked on Knicks. All right, guys, as promised, we are joined by Jake Rosen of Cerebro Sports, a returning guest. Jake, it's been a minute. Uh, it's been, uh, I, think, I think, a little over a year at this point, but you you went to yeah. Israel this past week. You had a spiritual <laughs> awakening. You said, I know what I need to do. I need to go back on Locked on Knicks and, and spit some draft heat. So uh, th- thanks so much for coming back, man. Happy to have you. Absolutely. I, well, I thoroughly enjoyed my time uh, it was definitely tough getting i got a bunch of uh twitter dms hey can you come on the pod can you come on the pod i'd love to come on the pod uh you, we're, we're both gonna have to wait a week but uh, i'm glad to be here now definitely it's always fun talking knicks draft um i am a knicks fan i, I think uh, i don't tweet about them a ton because there isn't a lot to tweet about but um i grew up being a knicks fan my entire life still root for the knicks um and yeah so it's fun talking uh potential prospects the state of the team all that all that good stuff Nice. And uh, th- things have changed a lot since we last had you on. So I wanted, I wanted to start there. Um, I, if, if I remember correctly, I think last time I talked to you, we were pretty optimistic about the direction the Knicks were headed. Obviously, the team did not have as good of a season, but I want to specifically focus on the young guys um, after that, particularly with that late run for Emmanuel Quickly and Obi Toppin. Uh, how are you feeling about the young core? And if, if you were running the team, like given how those guys played down the stretch, what would sort of be like your direction heading into this offseason? I think the Knicks are in a good spot. Uh, again, this is the tough part. And I was actually just on Locked On Pacers, and we were talking about the same thing. And I, I, well, I don't think the Knicks have a uh, young prospect caliber of Tyrese Halliburton. Um, the Knicks are in a similar spot where it's Knicks fans, like, we all have to embrace this long, hard fact that rebuilding is tough, and it's going to take a long time. Uh, it, like, you have to continue to stockpile and stockpile. And the Knicks, unfortunately, in, in I will call it like 20 or I don't want to like I don't know the initial year but like the Knicks went through a stretch of draft picks where they can just completely whiffed in the top 10 and got nothing um for top 10 picks and that's that's going to continue to stall your rebuild um what I am very excited about from a Knicks standpoint is that we're now working on a couple of drafts where we're getting value out of the players we select we might not have home runs that we wanted to um but you're getting value the player making con- contributions to your team um and once you just continue to do that you continue to put yourself in a position to when you do get that star you can kind of take off running um and i think that's a very good place that the knicks are in now which you hadn't really you've been able to say that in years prior um so yeah i'm excited about i'm excited about rj i'm excited about i I'm excited about top. Like, I think they're in a position where they should go with the best player they see av- available. Like, I don't necessarily think we're hampered to cater to anyone's needs. I don't think quickly is the point guard of the future. I think he's a very good player who can contribute. And I think the Knicks should absolutely prioritize getting him on a second contract in New York. But like, I don't think the Knicks have anyone currently, even Mitch, clearly. Um, like if someone like Jalen Duran, we're going to talk about is on the board. I think that's someone the Knicks should absolutely entertain. Um, I, I think the Knicks are in a good place where they can finally look in the mirror and be excited and rational and grounded that they have pieces that they can have going forward, but not necessarily where their hands are tied to cater to a certain need or seek out a certain skill set. Um, obviously, the Knicks should get a point guard. That is, and we've been saying that for years now. I don't really think there's a point guard in this draft that the Knicks should prioritize, like specifically at 11. Um, it's just not necessarily something I'm into, but uh, I do think there are will be a handful of players on the board where the Knicks can be excited about getting in the building, adding to the roster, and then just continuing to build moving forward. Yeah, so I think 
I, th- I think you nailed it, right? The Knicks have this great flexibility and, and people who are ultra pessimistic coming out of last season, like I don't think are seeing the full picture that they have all these supplementary pieces to your point. When you do eventually get that star in the building, you have a Quinn Grimes who, who seems ready-made to like play in like these NBA finals right now. You have an Emmanuel quickly who showed all these great flashes down the stretch. Obi Toppin, who now looks like if not a long-term starter, maybe a long-term starter, but if not at the very least legitimate NBA player, RJ uh, hitting, hitting his next level. Um, and when you, when, when you say the need for a point guard, I, I'm of the opinion that Emmanuel quickly could be the starting point guard on this team. But I think you get into something, uh, your coworker, uh, PD Webb talked about when he was on the pod, which is the need for advantage creation and that the Knicks don't have an obvious guy who fits in that mold. Obviously RJ Barrett does that to some extent, but there are limits to his efficiency. At this point, there are limits to him as a playmaker. And you still need that guy who can just bend a defense. And, and maybe the one guy in this draft who, who fits that mold to a T or at least to some extent, is Jaden Ivey. There have been a lot of rumors of late of the Knicks. Uh, I think Jake Fisher of Bleacher Report had the uh, had the report that uh, the Knicks were interested in trading up for him. And that's been that's been something Alex and I have focused on heavily the last couple of shows. Where are you at on the Knicks making that push up the board? It seems like they probably have to get to four because I don't think he'll make it to six with Indiana. Mm. I, I think if he's there for Detroit, I, I can't imagine they pass on him. I don't see Detroit trading back. I don't really know what the logical trade is between the Knicks and the Kings, but my, my instinct is, and I don't, I don't know what this means, but the Knicks would have to overwhelm them. But I'll, I'll throw it to you, Jake. Do you think Jaden Ivey is the type of player worth going all in on for the New York Knicks? So, I mean, obviously this is so contextual based on what you're giving up. You know, it's, it's all, it's always right. what it's going to come down to. Um, but in terms of is Jaden Ivey a prospect worth prioritizing and giving up future assets? Absolutely. Um, for me, I, I Jaden is someone He's in my personal top three, um, and I can see someone like I'm just I am really really high on the top three of this draft, um, which like it doesn't include Jabari Smith, my personal top three, um, with Chet, Paulo, and Ivy, and I think I'm super high on them all for different reasons, and Ivy is just so happens to be what the Knicks need the most, which is standstill advantage creation, and um, when you look at Jaden Ivy, I, I think it's just you're looking at a potential superstar bet, like that is if you look at the in season progression that he's made, the comfort he's grown into with using his tools as a stop start athlete just decimating the paint um growing comfortable in the pick and roll starting to work in that in between game and you know when he got interviewed at the combine just he said and you know it's it's funny we can say like oh his prospects self-awareness is so key like sometimes you see these guys just not aware of what they genuinely need to work on like the fact that someone asked i think it was mike schmitz um while he was still working for espn and we were lucky enough to having the public sphere you know what's what are you, what are you working on what do you need to improve on he's like my floater or my in-between game um and that's absolutely correct and so like seeing that self-awareness it progressed um that we have real evidence of that there watch those big 10 games like the game against illinois the game against michigan um two of potentially the most poster games of the entire cycle for me uh, that's just what it looks like um and, and i think you know, there's, I used to kind of think I got last cycle. Um, I, and even as early as the year, like I was so caught up in like, Oh, uh, there's a right way to do this. You don't go like, you don't need to go all in. You need to go all in like, and there's kind of no right way to do this. Like you just get the good players. You work with the infrastructure you have. Um, there are multiple ways to skin a cat, especially on offense. Obviously you need paint touches as we're talking about, but like, I, there's I, i'm so i'm kind of over the oh Jaden Ivey's on a primary you don't want to give up all this stuff for someone who's not a primary like, go get the guy like if you're confident in your evaluation and i'm confident my evaluation is jade in jade Ivey in being a potential stud ball handler that's what the new york knicks need go get it man and uh i think i'd be hesitant to like give up an unprotected first um in next year's draft because looking ahead like i do a lot of scouting stuff in high school and 2023 draft is very very strong but that's not to say like i I, we've fallen victim to, I told, I was telling people, yeah, he took a point guard in 2020 because Nico Mannion and Cole Anthony are going to be in 2021. How'd that pan out? Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously I, I'm, Scoot Henderson is a different caliber player and, you know, Nick Smith is a different caliber player, but then ping pong balls need to bounce your way. Um, and then that, both the ping pong balls need to bounce your way and that prospect that you're scouting a year ahead needs to pan out. Like there's just so many uncertainties. So I'm kind of operating under, the guys now like you see someone like Jay Nivey and there is a um trade package that the Sacramento Kings at four are willing to hear out that doesn't completely handicap you and handcuff you next year um I'm a strong advocate like we know we know what Jaden Ivey is now as a prospect and he's someone who is kind of tailor-made for the Knicks in every sense 
All right, guys, we'll be back with Jake in just a sec to talk about potentially trading up for Jaden Ivey and uh, maybe a little bit on the case against Shaden Sharp. But before I get into all that, uh, I want to tell you about one of our all-time favorites here at Locked On Knicks. It is, of course, Built Bar. Don't you love a chewy chocolate brownie? What about a caramel brownie with caramel swirled up top? I'm getting hungry just reading this. So good. What if I told you that you could have all that chewy, chocolatey deliciousness plus 17 grams of protein? You're in luck because caramel brownie bars are now available at Built.com right now. And you got to act fast because they're a fan favorite. Forget about dessert. They're better than dessert. Plus, the macros are unreal. 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, only 4 grams of sugar. I could replace a regular brownie with Built's Caramel Brownie Bar in a heartbeat. The best part, Caramel Brownie Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Like for real. With Built, you don't have to sacrifice taste for health. You can have both. And all of Built's bars are <laughs> made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. There are a million reasons you should try Built Bars, but for now, let's just say the Caramel Brownie Bar will rock your world. That is not an understatement. With Built, tasty is the new healthy. Go to Built.com to get your box of Caramel Brownie Bars right now. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. To that point, what, what does it look like if Jaden Ivey is successful in the NBA? Is it more Russell Westbrook, more John Morant, more John Wall, something completely different? What What, what is the mold for him to succeed? I mean, I definitely think there are some remnants of Ja. Like, I don't totally love the Ja stuff because, look, it's easy to see. Like, I, they their jump shots are mechanically similar. The hair is similar. The stop start is similar. Like, I get it. I see it. There are shades, absolutely. But, I'm like, I love Jaden because, I do picture him being able to go off ball and like really excel there. I do believe in the shot. He just showcased a ton of versatility coming off movement screens and pin downs. And, and I think there are ways to, like he's bigger than someone like Ja. I do think Jaden's a legit 6'4". Um, there are ways to leverage him both on and off the ball. And I just think he's such... I, I really don't think he's getting talked about enough at the top of this draft. Like he is someone who can both just eat paint touches and get them on demand and break down the defense and has shown growing proficiency as a passer, has gotten more comfortable as a finisher, improved mightily as a shooter, and just has ridiculously functional athleticism. Yet he doesn't need to be on the ball. He can go off the ball a little bit. He can work off pin downs. He can spot up and attack closeouts. He showed a ton of comfort as a cutter while playing with the FIBA team this past summer when surrounded by a ton of other talent. Like, there's so many ways where this could work, and I kind of feel like he's just being brushed under the rug as the fourth guy. And one, if he was there at four, you should be thrilled with getting him. And I am a little bit surprised that um, just like we aren't hearing about more teams going up to trade up and, and acquire him because it, it's just such a unique talent that I, I would think uh, more NBA teams would be salivating over. And I just, to your point, he just seems like so tailor-made for the Knicks, right? Probably one of the least athletic teams in the league right now. And the idea of having, like, if I was to build a dream guard next to quickly, maybe it would be someone like even bigger, like, like an Anthony Edwards type of guy, but Ivy's like pretty close to that mold. Like another guy who can split the ball handling duties. It's almost like if you have like two, three fourths of a point guard, maybe, maybe that adds up to one full point guard, but, but two guys who can split the ball handling duty, he can in transition. I think he would thrive with quickly oh, and Obi Toppin and RJ Barrett. Um, and, and just, and with someone like Grimes, like, like another like shooter and just like a really strong, flexible defender and you I mean Cam Reddish is, is maybe more of a fantasy at this point but like another like <laughs> big wing you could throw in the mix with those guys like if I'm like the the mold I've talked about the next before and, and and obviously they're not there yet but I, I do think like the path for them having success is maybe something kind of similar to the Grizzlies where they just don't play bad players and they just have all this depth because they do keep hitting those picks over and over again and, and to your point he's not exactly Morant but he can I think give some of the same things that Morant does to a Grizzlies team that otherwise static is the wrong word, but maybe just doesn't have a lot of juice without Ja. Like I, I think he could be the juice for this Knicks team if things work out. So the Grizzlies are so interesting to me because it's, it's both. You need both. Like the Grizzlies got a, get a ton of credit and rightfully so for just consistently nailing on the margins, like just absolutely you know, Bain, Tillman, Zaire even is able to like come in and give minutes. Like consistently just, getting in we'll call it in opportune draft situations and making it work however like yes they were without Ja. I i'm hesitant to say that like we can just take their record and exploit that in an entire season sample and just be like oh this still works without Ja. i, I don't really think it does 
I, I don't I can't really explain why they're so damn good without him. Um Bane's incredible and been great, but I just think like you need the stuff on the margins and then when you get that star it's all just supplemented and but like that's not to say that the margins don't matter like you shouldn't chase the margin until you have your star you shouldn't um like vice versa I, I don't really think there's one particular way to go about this um which is why like franz wagner was someone i loved in last year's draft because it was just like just take franz and like you're not going you can't go wrong in my opinion by just as you said continuing to get good basketball players and just like getting them in the building but that being said, when you see a star opportunity and a star bet, someone like Jaden Ivey, someone like John Morant, you go get it. And like you operate with conviction on that. So like when I see the rumors of the Knicks going up to get Ivy, like I love that. Um, you know, that's something that we kind of haven't seen the Knicks do. If you look at their draft history, it, it, it's kind of in the middle of uh, taking the star bet and taking the good basketball player. It's like Frank Nilakina or and Kevin Knox. Like didn't really fit either one of those builds. Um, it was kind of somewhere in the gray area, which didn't really turn out. Um, but now you look at the roster, like, I mean, I'm pretty, like, an Ivy, quickly, RJ, like, one, two, three, certainly lacks some playmaking. <laughs> um, but, you know, you can hopefully get a connecting four. Maybe, you know, you stagger Obi. them a little bit. Obi. Yeah. He's right there. Yeah. He's right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. You know, and I just think, like, I'm I'm much less worried than I was before. You know, I think it's so easy to get so caught up in the micro of uh, do they fit? It? Is it a proper? Is it this? Is it that? Like players, prospects develop. Players develop. Um, the best thing you can do is, as you said, get good players. Like you just like the best. That's the best way to kind of elevate this quickly. And I do think like the Knicks, young know, Corey, it, it's encouraging. It's super encouraging. I mean, obviously the elephant in the room is Julius Randle. Uh, um, and you know how he will likely continue to hamper the Knicks growth and kind of muddy the waters in their direction as a franchise. Um, because like my optimism with the Knicks last year was pretty much centered around, you know, the young core taking a leap and Randall showcasing maybe the ability to be a very viable NBA player, the shooting regression that I feared and was in my nightmares happened. And, uh, the lack of scalability was ridiculously evident. Um, that's a real problem the Knicks have to face, but independent from that, I still think they can, you know, excel and continue to build in the draft. Yeah, I think it's tough because I, I think a lot of times on these podcasts, I operate in a, in a fantasy world where he's already off the team and that, that hasn't happened yet. And that's what I'm area. saying. Yeah. It's a very it's good very chance very... that it doesn't happen to your point. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, I've, yeah, geez, Julius Randall, man, oh man, <laughs> uh, tough, tough, tough run for, tough run for our guy. Um, all right. But let's, let's talk about someone who in the past was, was part of the trade up conversation, but Seemingly, like by the day, it's growing more and more realistic that he might not be a trade-up candidate, and that is Shaden Sharp, someone we've covered a whole yeah. lot on this podcast. And I know there was this there was this surge of of Shaden Sharp optimism that I, as someone who uh, does not do this stuff for a living in terms of prospect evaluation, got caught up in. Where like a lot of people were like, "All right, like he's the real star in this draft. Like, how is this dude like not going top three? Like he, he's like he, he's he's like sort of the one like quintessential like like two guard like in the mold of like the Jalen Greens and the Anthony Edwards the last couple of years but now it seems like there's a little bit of a drop off with some weird stuff at the combine like and just general like lack of chances to see him like all the stuff with Kentucky I don't want to go too far into specifics because PD did a really good job covering it when he was on but what do you think of Sharp as a prospect what do you think of his fit on the Knicks and what do you think of the odds that he actually gets to 11 or, or close enough that the Knicks could maybe dangle some extra asset to go up and get him what I've been telling people recently is if you took Shaden Sharp's body of work, which is like what I'm referring to is a literal 12 game sample in an EIBL bubble. Like this is what we're, we are working with. Um, yeah. Potentially like a, a, the COVID stuff affected him more than anyone. We just don't, I, I don't have film. There is not film. It does not exist. Um, it's not necessarily for lack of availability. He just didn't play. Um, what we basically have is like, his grind session high school film, um, which like I don't really think is a valuable sample, the UIBL stuff, uh, which is extremely competitive, but it is AAU basketball. Um, and his uh, he played three games in like an exhibition scrim like fall scrimmage thing, uh, where he looked very disengaged. Um, so that's what we have. So I'm kind of referring to the UIBL sample. And if you would have picked up like the numbers, how he got his buckets all that stuff, and you would have put that in like a power five conference, this would be a ridiculously hard evaluation. We are not working with that. We are working with extrapolating this from an AAU bubble um, over a two-week span. 
So yes, it gets even murkier than that. With Shaden, like it, it's just fit for the Knicks. Um, in all, in a, like, just to be brutally honest, like I, I am someone who's still holding out hope for Shaden. I think his shot making is utterly ridiculous. Um, he is a wild vertical athlete when he has time and space to leap. Has real issues as a creator. Uh, lackluster first step, gets wallowed off a ton. The handle isn't totally there. Decision making and process as a driver is not there. Um, like his counters, he's just not a creator. Like he is very clearly leaning, learning on the fly as a primary ball handler and was given full autonomy to do so, which led to a lot of step backs, which like he can't at a ridiculous rate. I, um, I think the pitch for Shaden is much more rooted in an off ball scorer and a high level shooter who is a cutter and comes off pin downs and uses like scheme to get downhill, but isn't necessarily your pre like carrying a like big usage. Um, he showed a little bit of proficiency as a passer, but not necessarily anything you love for someone who isn't getting downhill. Like thing with Ivy is Ivy got downhill ridiculously often, collapsed the defense, and then was given you know reads on a platter. Um, because the defense was in such an array. Shaden doesn't do that. You know, he doesn't have that effect on defenses. They swarm to him and they flock to him, especially when he's like thrown off ball in a movement shooting situation because that's it's a, that's a threat. You want to run him off the line. But from a primary ball handling standpoint, he doesn't he doesn't cause he doesn't incur that same reaction on the defense. I mean it's very much in a vacuum, which is totally okay. But of course this is gonna limit from an individual creator and you know extrapolating into other aspects of your game. So we're talking about a tough shot maker who lives off bad process and doesn't get paint touches. Is there anyone who needs that less in the entire league than the New York Knicks? Like I would probably say no. Um, so while I do think shade, like yeah, that'd be super enticing. Like I don't, but obviously rely on who else is on the board. I don't know if I would take him um, at 11 for the Knicks, honestly. Um, and it just goes to like, you don't want to draft off fit, but, I just don't know if he like. I don't know if the Knicks are in a position where that's the right gamble. Is what yeah. I would say. Yeah, it seems like to your point, like he needs someone to play off of, right? And the Knicks don't necessarily have that guy. Yeah, exactly. And I and I think you know we just talked about stockpiling good players and like getting them in the building, um, and just going from there and not necessarily worrying about fit. But the thing with Shaden is that like you're going to need a certain context for him to be, um. Not a, I don't say a good player, but like the best optimized version of himself. And I don't think the Knicks like are in a position to provide that. Uh, and, and so I think in addition to it being a gamble, just from a lack of sample and your swinging and all that stuff, like even if you do get and that stuff is on the surface and isn't for and comes to fruition, like I, I don't even think the Knicks can you know be in a position to totally reap the benefits of that. All right, let's, let's talk about someone who I assume you're very familiar with, uh, Johnny Davis of the yes. University of Wisconsin, uh, where you happened to attend school to, uh, I, I assume, uh, or at least last time we talked, you did. Um, but uh, yeah, I assume you've gotten a lot of time watching him. Uh, what do you think of his game and, and what do you think of his ultimate fit on the Knicks? Um, my number one target for the Knicks, absolutely. Um, and it's not because he solves your problems in a day. And it, like, I think if when you're taking Johnny Davis, you have to really adapt um, the philosophy and thought process. This is going to be a long process. We are not like Rome wasn't built in a day, and uh, being a successful and competent competitive basketball team certainly will not be built in a day. Um, as we've shown, we've tried to repeatedly and repeatedly solve all of our issues in one offseason. It doesn't work. Um, it just doesn't work. However, Johnny Davis is a piece. Um, and, and I think when you're working outside the top three or four, obviously, like, look, we have you have gambles all the time in the draft. Shea Gilch Alexander is in the early teens, Donovan Mitchell in the early teens, like offensive superstars. Very well could be uh, one in this class. However, there's not one I'm confident in, and where your gamble, where the gamble is all of a sudden worth it, and uh, you know you're comfortable selling out. So for me, in this range, like I'm com focused on getting good basketball players that I see complementing the Knicks in the future. Um, and Johnny Davis is someone that. I believe, you know, every franchise could use. Like you're getting a two-way strong off guard who I believe in the shot, um, can attack closeouts, eats up space, will need to improve as a handler, but grew as a passer as the year went on, um, can really guard, can re really operate in the mid-range game. <laughs> like doesn't get a ton of paint touches off the bounce. Um, it's a lot of what the Knicks kind of uh, fall victim to now, which is why I'm saying he doesn't like this current version of the Knicks, he does not solve their problems. However, I think we can both acknowledge like this current version of the Knicks isn't being optimized anyway. I'm not really too worried about it. The Knicks being a competitive team with 
quickly and RJ and OB and all these young guys and like someone like Johnny Davis is going to look entirely different from a schematic standpoint than who they are right now. So I'm not entirely worried about, you know, Johnny uh, in particular furthering the bad habits where he differs from Shaden is like, I'm very confident in Johnny being a two-way cog who can play alongside anyone. Shaden, we didn't even talk about the defense. It's like, is atrocious um and you know i think he's a high volume scorer instead of a scalable complementary piece um talking about hampering your flexibility i think Shaden might do that um it's i do think there is a lot of boomer bust uh, unfortunately versus johnny is steady um you know there might not be the high end upside that people are uh, screaming from the rooftops about but I- i'm confident in him being a good basketball player uh, that you can continue to count on as a piece um and continue to build that infrastructure so when then you know that star bet does come along, whether that be in the draft or I'm not even going to mention the word free agency. But when that star bet does come around, you know, you can continue to rely on and feel comfortable on your complimentary creators and um, who can play off advantages and run second side actions and play good defense. And I, I think Johnny is just like a home run for any team who's looking to continue to do that. Who does it, who does it look like with him if he's successful? Um, I think he's, best as your secondary or probably tertiary creator um but someone who can legitimately run pick and roll like run second side pick and rolls the shot coming around and being a viable avenue for him like both as a catch and shoot shooter and then someone who can then attack closeouts um he's incredible functional tools he's super strong no great touch in the mid range really good at reading opponents and like rejecting screens like that's like his specialty is like rejecting screens um taking what the defense gives him and you know, he was much burstier in the beginning of the year. He did catch an injury um, and then got pretty hampered towards the end. And I don't think that gets talked about enough. Um, like the early season, Johnny was just getting wherever he wanted on the floor. Like, go watch that Purdue game. Um, absolutely, like, was the best part on the floor uh, with Jay Navi there in yeah. Mackey Arena um, and just got wherever he wanted. Wisconsin gave him a ton of high pick and roll, and he just ate off that for an entire game. I don't think that's the most optimized version of him is letting him run wild as your high volume lead ball handler, but you're getting someone who can legitimately create and legitimately attack um, in addition to someone who's going to guard the heck out of the ball, um, especially off the ball. And uh, I, I just think a, a, you're getting a two way complimentary four who can be a release valve with tough shot making, get to the rim occasionally and make the right reads when he draws the defense. And that's a very valuable player to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I remember the, I think the first time you came on, we, we talked about an article you'd written on this subject, but I think, and it, it's just, it's it, to your point on, on context, it, it's so hard to say like who quickly is, who OB is because they got like the larger sample size we got from them was at the end of the season where there are like mm-hmm. these fluky hot stretches from guys. But I do think there is like, there's an additive or exponential effect, right. To, to stringing together, like just very savvy players like that. And I think IQ is that. I think Obi is that. I really think Grimes is that. I think Deuce and Sims have that IQ defensively. And I think as they catch up to the speed of the game, it'll it'll show on offensively. Like even with Sims, you started seeing it where he would get an offensive rebound and then immediately like zip a pass out to an open shooter behind the arc. But I, I think there's something I mean, and again, it's like, I think a lot of what Memphis was when there was no John Morant, it was sort of the additive effect of just having all these really smart really savvy, tough, aggressive dudes and, and just stacking them one on top of the other. And I think Johnny would would maybe be another piece in that puzzle. And, and to your point, I think when you get to later rounds of the playoffs, it's not enough. Like you need that transcendent talent, whether it's like Steph shooting or Jaws athleticism or or Jason Tatum shot making and, and the Knicks still have to find that piece. But I, I, I like how you framed it. Like you can't the idea and the mistake that I think the Knicks made last off season was that last season's team was a finished product in some way. And it was like, all right, we just got to add some stuff on the margins and, and we're going to, we're going to burst out and we're going to be yeah. incredible. When, when really like it was built to your point on like this flukish season from Julius Randall. And there was just nothing you were, you were building a house on like non solid bedrock essentially. And 100%. The point is, you, you want that bedrock as solid as possible when the star comes. Like, obviously, if you if you find the star, if you get the Jaden Ivey, you're not going to say, oh, we're not ready for him. You're going to take the guy. But if that guy's not available, which it seems like he's probably not going to be for the Knicks, just keep building out that bedrock as long as you need to until you can find that person. All right, guys, that is it for this episode with Jake Rosen. I know I'm just as upset about it as you guys are, but don't fret. Jake will return on Monday. 
uh, with more thoughts on some top prospects. We have we get into a pretty interesting debate whether the Knicks should consider taking Jalen Duran or just pay Mitchell Robinson to fill the center spot. And we finish up with some thoughts uh, because Jake was curious about mine and I was curious about his on Jalen Brunson potentially ending up in New York Knicks and uh, New York Nick and his fit there. So all that and more on Monday. But for now, enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm Gavin Chill. Peace out.